All right, we are here with Sarah Buxton, which I have a couple questions I was, I was thinking about before you came over. I'm going to get to them in a second uh, mm-hmm. before we get to the traditional type, you know, get to know you stuff. But I think the last time that I saw you was maybe you were in with Dustin Lynch. Yes. And early. In the morning. Er, I just remember. It early. wasn't even that early. For me, it was it's late for lunch. <laughs> For you, maybe early, but you have that creative, you know, I don't know, you sleep later than I do probably. I, I, I'm both. I, I, I do the early morning thing and I also like, I like mornings and evenings. I, I don't choose. like mornings. I, if I have five days off, I'm back to sleeping. My natural clock is 11 a.m. to wake up. That's my natural clock. And I, oh wow. And I can go to sleep at two or three in the morning and it just feels great. So I love that, that. that's what my body is supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I think we all have different clocks. Um, right. Now, I have to wake up at 3.30, 4, and I've been doing it since I was 22, so for a long time, and I'm still not used to it, and I will never get used to it. It's not what I'm supposed to do, and when I meet somebody who's like, I love waking up at 4 o'clock and having a coffee and exercising, that's like you're speaking Mandarin to me. Totally. Don't understand it. Well, I think I got into it when I had kids, and they started going to school, and it was like that rush before school. I was like... How can I do this where I'm not immediately fulfilling a role for someone, like first thing in the morning? Because that sucks. <laughs> I want to be a person with my own thoughts and my own way of being in the world before I become mom. So do you not have to wake up as early anymore? I've been getting up at 7. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, yeah. I, I like getting up at five because I go for a super long run and I can like meditate and like. You like getting up at five. I do like it, Oof. but I'm not doing it. I'm staying up late. I'm hanging with friends. Mm-hmm. I have like a nightlife now. That's cool. Because I've gone through a divorce. My life is a little different now. You know, you when you came in, you were singing the background vocals for Dustin Lynch. And I, it just escapes me what song it was. But did you also write the song or did you just sing on it? Because people no. love you for all different reasons. Right. And, and it's crazy. They may call you to sing or they you may write. Right. Exactly. I I am calling in more vocal sessions. Like, that's something that I specifically said out loud, like, a month ago. And I've gotten, like, called to sing on, like, three or four different records this last month. So it's like a God universe thing saying, yes, you should be doing that. Um, do you believe that you put it out there, therefore it's happening? Did, I do. Did you allow it to be yes. heard by others and they knew? Like, what, how do you explain that? Well, I didn't grow up in a religious home, but my grandmother, you know, was Mennonite and my grandpa was like a preacher's son. And so both of she married an atheist and he just didn't ever like send his kids to, to church, but lots of like Christian you know, values are instilled in my family just because of the way that they were raised. But I really was, my dad was an atheist my whole life until he was like diagnosed with cancer last year, which totally changed everything. And he got way into Ram Dass and like got into um, the soul, you know. How did you feel feel about about that when he was, Um, um, obviously something traumatic was happening, but he was, and not the cancer part, but... Uh, mm-hmm. What happened because of that? He started to have a fundamental change. Well, it's been great for me. They used to drop me off at church. Like when I was little, they would like drop me off. He'd be like, does this bother you that we're just like dropping you off? And I, I was just drawn to it. I've always been drawn to spirituality. So um, so that was amazing for me when this happened. Obviously, there was a lot of pain and there was a lot of grief around like my hero, the superhero, like getting cancer and like crying to me on the phone and you know, talking about death and all these different things. and But really, it transformed my family. It definitely transformed my dad and my relationship with him, um, which was amazing because it happened at the very same time as my divorce. So it was almost like this one man was, like, leaving my life and then the OG, like, my original man coming, coming, back, in. coming back in with all this intimate, amazing conversation and... I can't remember why we started talking about that. What was I saying? Well, I was no, saying, what I was um, asking was, do you feel like that you put it yeah, into oh, the, Yeah. Or do you feel like you literally just said to people, hey, if something comes open. I think it's both. Okay. I put it on Instagram. So you kind of got to go. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's a little, little bit of both. Product. Yeah. What, um, what do you put on Instagram, though? Like, how do you say that? How do you, how do you say it? I took a picture of me with my new rig sitting at my desk, and I said, 
hey, call your girl. You want some Buxty sprinkles on your music? Like, I look at myself like, I just love collaborating. I mean, it was always hard for me to be an artist um, because so much of it is about branding, which I really have to work hard to like get in that mindset. Like, I really love just collaboration. I love the the making of it so much. And then when it comes time to like package it, I have to try really hard to like stay focused. Um, but um, that's what I love about the way that my career has worked out is like, it's turned out there's all these different facets of it. And I, now I'm releasing my own music again and I'm not scared of, I would, I would welcome anyone that wants to come into my life and help me brand it. I, that's not what I'm good at, but I love putting the music out and I love singing on other people's music and I love writing songs with people. I, the, the best thing about being a songwriter is like you could be in this mode in the morning, in this right, and then in the evening go be in a totally different zone and you don't have to be so attached to it being anything. I just like the, the cornucopia of different collaborations. You know, speaking of that, uh, a friend of mine, Eric Pasley, mm, who's just yeah. a wonderful writer, and a great artist, and uh, you did a song with him, and I remember seeing, yeah. what was the name of that song? Well, We have it, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I, I remember you distinctly singing on it. Here's a clip of it right here. Yeah. Yeah, Heartbeat Higher, yeah. Eric Pasley. Yeah, so, and that's what I meant. It's like I never know how you've been involved in a project. Like you will come in and sing with Dustin, yeah. and then you've yeah. written this song, and then you're... Yeah. So I, but I think that's probably with you being like me. Like I have a lot of things that I try to do and yeah. try to do them yeah. well, but that's just the fulfillment for me is to be in a lot of places because I need to be stretched and doing different things or I get bored very easily. So do I. So... Yeah. I like to be pushed. And the best way to get pushed is to really like let someone into the process that has a different process. That's how I look at it. Like uh, the new, I'm working on some new music with a acoustic guitar. Well, he plays all kinds of stuff, but he's a guitar player and he approaches things from a different place than I do. And I just love inviting people out. I'm like, bring your whole self to this. Like push me like beyond my uh, normal boundaries and it's just that's to me the best way to learn all the different things that you can do you know you have a nightlife now you have a new EP yeah, yeah but we're gonna go through a lot of this <laughs> but what I want to talk about first is I program a national uh, weekend show called the women of our country and I played your song rain like this on our women of our country show and here's a clip of that right here no, it isn't gonna rain like this forever baby I could never stay Keep the house, cause it feels so empty now. So you're never gonna change as the tears run down my face. But it isn't gonna rain like this forever. So, with you being such a prolific songwriter, should I assume that you wrote these songs? Yeah, all I wrote these. So they're your voice, your your voice yeah. and your voice. My voice and yeah, both voices. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so you're, you're double voice in these. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With that track, I heard it, and I think we all relate to our own story inside of whatever story you're sharing. Yeah. Meaning I know this is your personal story, but I think what is universal is, is it always going to rain like this? We always feel like that at some point. <laughs> and, and not just some point, over and over again. Right. It's a constant battle that yeah. we're going through. Like, man, this kind of sucks right now. Mm -hmm. Is it always going to suck like this? How do I not have it suck like this? Is it me? Is it? This? I think it's, a, right. it's an eternal struggle. So when I heard the song, it struck me. Because I felt, wow, first of all, it's a great song. It sounds great. You sound Thank great, you. obviously. But tell me about writing this song and just where you were in your life and even in that room when you sat down to write it. Mm -hmm. Well, this was right. I wrote this about three weeks after I told my husband that I didn't want to be married anymore. So I had moved into a different room in the house, and the kids didn't know at the time. Um and it just sucked. I mean, I never, you know, nobody's divorced in my family. This is actually my second divorce. 
I'll be honest. I was married for like three months when I was 21. So that doesn't count. You were <laughs> right. 21 and it was three months. It doesn't count. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, thank you. Doesn't okay, count. thank you. But yeah. technically, if you look it up, you know, it's in there. <laughs> but um, it just was awful. And, um, you know, to me, like when I had no idea that my dad at the time had cancer. And so the story, I'm kind of going forward a little past the time that I wrote it. Um, but I've had to really learn how to like feel really hard feelings. I, I am... Um, I tend to like really avoid pain and um, I avoid like I've avoided, you know, getting out of this marriage for a really long time because I just didn't want to feel how I thoroughly actually felt underneath. And so kind of going into those things, I've learned how to cry, like really cry like a baby. And I've learned how to... Um, I guess they say in that book, what nonviolent communication, they say like you need like 90 seconds of like pure emotion to like fully process what you're feeling. But um, Real, I've never heard that. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever experienced 90 seconds of pure emotion. I'm like you. I, I don't. Yeah. I think I had so much trauma as a kid yeah. that I and I've after we finish this half an hour of therapy today and what we deal with. And it's just funny you bring that up is I never get too high or too low. Yeah. Which allows, which doesn't allow me to feel the highs because I refuse to feel the lows. Smart. I mean, like much respect because, yeah. Well, I don't. I would let myself. I don't think feel it's healthy. Highs. I don't. You okay? Go ahead. I would. I mean, I've always been. I mean, I am a. You know, I've been diagnosed. I don't think I have manic depression. I don't think I am bipolar. I've been like diagnosed by people that would like say that I'm not manic depressive. I'm not even depressed. I'm not, I don't have bipolar disorder. I just didn't know how to feel my feelings. And I needed to eat a sandwich and I needed sleep and water. So I, there was things like at that time, those times in my life. But, you know, I'm, I'm not in my 20s anymore. And just now I'm, now I'm like, okay, to me, like this. And, and once I started feeling, I'm like, when is this going to end? Like, will I keep crying like this? Like, will I was this just going to go on and on? And the answer is no, because you do process the feeling and you do make decisions that, and make you start to change your life and you start to make choices and realize this person just constantly makes me feel this way. And it's okay. It's not unloving to detach myself from that situation. Um, I'm curious when you write a song like this, if mm -hmm. because you mentioned... And I struggle with that too, feeling, you know, 90 seconds feels like an eternity. That's, yeah. like, that's like a year. Oh. To, I mean, wow. When you said that, I was like, I never heard that before. And It feels like 10 minutes. Yeah. Whenever you write a song that is, and, I, and I'm not going to stand the song, the whole the whole you know, interview here, yeah. but this song touched me and that's why I grabbed it. I was like, let me, let me just play it. But I wonder, because I struggle with communication, being extremely vulnerable with people and feeling emotion, unless... There's some sort of, I'm going to call it a facade, of a microphone in front of me. Mm -hmm. If I'm on a stage and I'm doing a motivational talk, I can go into places that I could not. If these microphones were not in front of us right now, I could never have this conversation with you. Right. And it's, you know mm -hmm. what? It's a real conversation. Yeah. But because I have like a, a my Clark Kent glasses here with this microphone. Yeah. You can't really, it feels like, well, you still can't really tell who I am. Yeah. And I wonder when you write a song like this. Mm-hmm. And you talk about struggling with emotion. Are you in that room the same way I do a microphone where it's mm -hmm. like, this is safe. Yeah. It doesn't matter how deep oh. I go. This, I, I can go places here that I can't go other places. So I wrote this with uh, Maddie Diaz and Kate York, who are two of my best friends. And this was coming out of 2020, which I had no creative outlet really. But I mean, I had like a garden and shit like that. But like, um, <laughs> I mean, like I had some creative outlets, but like and cooking, but. There was no in-person rights and I was in Idaho with my family, which I do every summer. And I was just like, I want to make music here, this place where I feel so at home in nature. And so I invited them up and we got this cabin in Fisher Creek in Idaho. And, and to me, that was the thing was like, we were out in nature. We were like sitting around a fire. Everybody was like barefoot or just in swimsuits, just fat rolls hanging out. Nobody cares. Like everybody's just hanging, hiking, smell, you know, taking naps. Everybody was just 
relax. And it was on that trip that I actually realized that I needed to get this divorce. Like this is, has to happen now. And it was really hard to wrap my mind around it, but we were so at home with each other. I mean, I don't feel, I feel so myself with these girls. Like it was so honest and they were just so supportive and that the song just was really intimate. The project, and we'll get back to it, is called Moonriser. So you can find all, yeah. all five tracks there. And I'll ask this quickly because I do want to get into kind of the origin story of you and here, and then we come back to this. Yeah. But why Moonriser? Every night, that was like the main event. Like we would have like a rhythm of the day. We'd hike in the morning and then start writing around 12 or so, 11, 12. We'd write a couple songs that afternoon. We would take a quick nap. Everybody would like get up, maybe shower, but we would like start a fire. Maybe shower. Yeah. Maybe shower, mm-hmm. like start a fire kind of get dinner going, eat dinner, and, like, start riding. And, but when the moon would start rising, we'd be like, oh, she's coming up. She's coming up. And just imagine over this ridge with these, all these dead trees. They have all these dead trees. I don't know why they're all. Actually, there's a Japanese beetle. That's why they're dead. But, like, the moon would come up, and we would just be like, woo! You know, just, like, howl at it. And just, it was, like, the moment of our of our night. And... We didn't know what these songs were for. We weren't necessarily writing them for an EP for me. We were just, like, writing. Were they all written Mm -hmm. in this? Actually, there was two trips. There was one in Idaho, and then there was another one outside. uh, It was Signal Mountain. Same vibe, same people? Same people, same thing. Watching the moon rise, screaming at it, yelling at it, fire, hikes, Nobody died. You did these crazy trips and nobody died. Nobody died. died. Nobody got eaten by a wolf, nothing. Nobody got eaten by a wolf. That's a victory itself right No. One of us came back and decided to get a divorce, but that was all (laughs) the damage that was done. (laughs) Growing up in Kansas, and did you grow up in Lawrence or near Lawrence? I grew up in Lawrence. You did? Okay. Have you been to Lawrence? I have because I've played a couple of shows in Lawrence because of the school. Yeah. Yeah, because of the University of of Kansas. It's a cool town. It is a cool town. So, but Kansas is KU. Yeah. So, yeah. Kentucky is UK. Right. Kansas is KU. Right. Now, did you, are you a Jayhawk fan? Hell yeah. Okay. So, are you, do you know that <laughs> they're about to play in a couple of days? Well, yes. I guess by the time this is heard, they're playing this, you know, this weekend. Right. They're the number one seed. Yes. Oh my gosh. How do you feel about that? I feel really good about it. You it's good them. to know. Well, my, my family's always pretty down at the beginning of the season. Everybody's like, oh, they look horrible, you know? And everybody's like so down about it. But then as things go on, I mean, we're really lucky to have. Why Lawrence, Kansas? Like, why, why did your parents have you and, and have the family in Lawrence, Kansas? Well, my mother was born there. My grand, her parents grew up in Eudora, which is just outside of Lawrence, but they raised their kids in. Lawrence and my dad grew up in Ransom, Kansas, in Western Kansas, and he went to KU. And so my parents were both at KU student teaching. So it's in your blood. And they met camping. Mm. They went out like camping and they fell in love. Like, oh yeah, it's in my blood. Did you go to school there at all or did you just move off and start being creative? Um, I did not go to school there. I, I came to Belmont. Okay, so you had to, you moved off to be creative. I mean, Belmont is a school yeah. where if you're going to do music, oh yeah, I was almost dead to... set. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I understand that because I am a diehard Arkansas Razorback fan. I'm from Arkansas. Yeah. It's all we have. We don't have a pro team. But Kansas, they have the Royals. Yeah. You kind of split that with them. Yeah. But they, they would always lose. The Royals only started winning recently, and same with the Chiefs. Like, it was just not the best. And But KU. So, so you moved to Belmont, and I couldn't go to the University of Arkansas because I was already working. I had to ch- chase my, and it hurt me so bad to not go to school there because it, I know. I loved and adored, but yeah. I had to go and chase this dream. I know. So you moved to Nashville and you, you, you come to Belmont, but why Belmont? Like, what did you think you were going to do by going to school in Nashville? Well, I actually wanted to go to Berkeley in Boston. And my mom was like, no, it's too close to New York City. And basically, I don't trust you. <laughs> Were you were you a trouble kid? Were you getting trouble? No, I was like I was actually most honorable senior in my. I don't know why she didn't. I think she was just maybe it wasn't that she didn't trust me. Okay, I, okay, I'm gonna be completely honest with you right now. Okay, I something happened to me in high school. Like a group of girls really broke my heart. We're good now. We've all made up, but they really broke my heart. And um, 
it changed me. Like that was kind of when I became a songwriter. And like, I don't know how else to say this other than it was dark. It really hurt me like big time. And I questioned everything about my life. Um, I had grown up like I was like such a good kid. I was a people pleaser like in grade school. And I did go through something like when I was in junior high, I had like severe, pretty severe anorexia. Um, so I'd, I'd been through some things, but by the time I got into high school, I mean, I had like a great time. I was in cross country. I was in band. I was in choir and I was like getting good grades and I had the best boyfriend ever. Like he was such a great guy, you know, no trouble there. But then that happened and I was just like, okay, I, I, everything from the clothes that I was wearing to just my approach to life. I honestly feel like I, it brought me into my artistry. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but it was a catalyst. And um, in college is when I really started exploring the wilder side of life. <laughs> and I, I guess I asked that because maybe your mom was just super protective coming from Kansas. She maybe was. it was New York City she was afraid of more than you going to New more York City. More than me. Because yeah. me growing up in Arkansas, every, we were scared of that. That wasn't a real place. That was a place on TV. Exactly. And so, right. so you, you moved to Nashville. Seems safer anyway. I wasn't interested in singing country music. And so Berkeley was more appealing to me. And mm, when I first moved it. to Nashville, I was really interested in like more rock and roll. Yeah, because you did like, like, like a Southern rock yeah. touring band. I had band a jam band. Bit, huh? Did you was it jam as in you did new new songs original original songs or it was did you original both? songs and no and cover songs and we were kind of um, doing it the way like widespread panic had done it was the was nineteen the minute vision. songs that's what I hear nineteen oh, minute songs listen. and everybody's high oh god it was I, like I had a djembe I had like velvet tie dyed skirts and like a djembe and like bells around my ankles and I mean it was fun we had so much fun I bet that traveling mm -hmm. group of folks we, what, was quite the scene. Oh, it was so much fun. We played frat parties and like Ole Miss and we went to Arkansas. We, we played in Fayetteville and like it was this a Southeast. What was the goal of. with that though? It was to grow and to be a part of that, of that scene. It was never to have like necessarily like radio songs. It was all about the jam. It was all about the show and like the energy and the connection, but I, my voice just got tired yeah. of screaming and singing that loud over two drum sets and like. You had two drummers. I had two drummers. Wow. Yeah, and um, that's but like, that's like some Doobie Brothers type stuff. It was yeah. Almond Brothers, Doobie Brothers. Yeah. Um, and we covered Almond Brothers and Doobie Brothers, but um, then one day in a dressing room here, Eva Cassidy was playing in a. Um, Are you in college while this is happening? I was in college. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I had dropped out. I only went to Belmont for basically like a year. Okay, before year we get half. to this this story, you went for a year. I just want to know why you went. With the intention to yeah. study what? Um, just vocal performance. Okay. And it wasn't, and it and, and it was very classical. So I wasn't getting very good. It they wasn't really, country, and it was classical. It was classical, and it was very like they let me in on probation because they could tell I had some rasp in my voice and that they were concerned about. So it was always like, "What does that mean, probation? Mm. Like you're going to jail if you suck? Like we're gonna let yeah. you in, but if, you're, right. if you don't do well, right? Maybe it wasn't called probation. You're in the music penitentiary. Yeah, wait, <laughs> maybe it had another name. Like we'll see how this goes with her. That's like, a bad name if that's what they named it. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't know. You're you're okay. So let's go back to where you were. Yeah. So you're you're touring. You're in a room. Who did you run into? So I heard an Eva Cassidy song, and she is. I don't know who that is. I'm gonna play. Okay, Del. you gotta check her out. She's okay. incredible. She's no longer living. She had, uh, I think, melanoma and died really young. But she became. It was posthumous that she became famous. And she has incredible records. I mean, any of you listening should check out. It's EVA Cassidy. I mean, she's incredible. And it's just the most pure voice. And she's an angel. She's, I don't know how else to say it. She's just an angel. And I was just trying on some clothes in a dressing room. And it just stopped me in my tracks. I'm like, whoosh, to the to the door. I'm like, who is this? And they're like, this is Eva Cassidy. So I went home and started listening to her music. And I was like, I am quitting this band. I just it moved you that sing. much. You hearing oh, yeah. that vocal, or do you remember what it was? Do you remember the exact song or the the record? Because I mean, to I think be it was Fields of Gold. Because you were struck so much. Oh yeah. That it pivoted oh, I know your what it life. Was. It's called. 
Um, it wasn't Fields of Gold. It was, um, I found a picture. It's called um, Time is a Healer. Mike, will you find that, please? Mm-hmm. Oh, if I, if I, Lord. If I hear this song, and mm. then I decide to go into, like, rodent management, I'm going to be mad at, mad at you. You made me pivot my, my career. Let's listen here. Oh, my God. The burden of anger. It's the chorus that I love. From a heart filled with pain. So you hear this and you're so struck. Why? What about this spoke to you specifically? The the clarity in her voice. I was pushing my voice so hard, and I just loved the clarity in her voice and like the simplicity of it, it was more song driven. And my other songs with Stoic Oak were, were jam driven. Stoic Oak is a pretty good name though. I'll yeah, it was, a, it. it was yeah. a fun thing. Mm-hmm. But like, I was like, I want to, it called me to uh, deepen my songwriting craft and to make it more about my voice. So you go tell the band, hey, Stoic Oak, I'm, I'm out of 5,000? Yeah, or what? They're, right. They're good? They or? were so upset because they... we were a band. I mean, we were mm. going to do this forever. And it was a time. But um, Then what do you do? You move back? I guess you're still in Nashville. You're we're still traveling. in Nashville. But I'm you just sorry. come back, and then what do you do the first day you're out of Stoic Oak? Because you just made a big decision. Well, I had already signed a publishing deal with a place called Song Planet. Um, to write what kind of music? To write that music, Stoic mm. Oak, to write that. Got it. Okay. And they, but they really believed in me too, just doing my own thing. And so, um, but even those recordings, they were just awful. I mean, they were god awful. And so I had to then separate myself from that situation too, to keep it about me and what I wanted. And um, but I remember, like, the first song I ever co-wrote outside of that was called. Um, that's not true. I think I was in the band when I wrote it. It was called Oasis. I wrote it with Sarah Majors. But um, I started going to L.A. and writing with uh, Jamie Houston out there and um, having not the best time. I loved, like, the music that I was making with him, but I didn't have any friends out there. So I was, like, working there, and I was, like, kind of going to New York for a while and writing with some people there. But I was – I just wasn't, like – into like going to bars by myself and like yeah like meeting people and like I just wasn't doing that and I was just kind of lonely when I was there and the men the men that I was writing with were like these older like married men do you know what I mean so the vibe was like I'm this young singer and then there's this older guy that I'm writing with my my actually songwriting career was like that for a while so then what do you do to change that? Because you didn't mention writing a lot in Nashville. You mentioned L.A. and New York. L.A. and New York. And even when I was started, so, well, should I go back and then? You can do whatever you want. We're here just kind of discovering, <laughs> okay, okay. discovering well, what's going on. So that kind of went in through all these years of, like, country songwriting, too. And I didn't have, like, a lot of collaborators that were women. Um, it was just a different scene. And I think that kind of changed when I started working with a band that I'm in, uh, was in and am in, I guess, with uh, Kate York, uh, Daniel Tashin, and Ian Fitchuk. And um, Kate York, I wrote all these Moonriser songs with. Daniel and Ian, people would know from? Casey Musgraves. Mm-hmm. They produced and yeah. wrote a lot of stuff with her from And Brett Golden Eldridge's Hour. last album, too, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and so we kind of started a band, um, and that was a turning point for me just as far as, like, really collaborating with friends. Truly. Um, not that I wasn't friends with my, like Dave Berg, I wrote Stupid Boy with him and Deanna Bryant. They were my friends, but, um, and still are. I don't mean past tense friends. Everybody's they dead. They were my friends what and year, now they're not. What year was, what, like what year are we talking here? This was with, with Skyline Motel, that band. Yeah. Um, that was, I think it, it was actually the beginning of 2012. Okay. So before that, we're going to mm-hmm. jump back yeah, a sorry. little bit. Um, you know, you had put out some songs yourself in the country oh, yeah. music world. Um, I want to play for you Innocence. It's from 2006. It's that young girl wide-eyed first love on time innocence. That was a top 40 song. This is mm-hmm. a top 30 song. This is That Kind of Day. Oh, 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 oh. 50 bucks is all I got. When times are tough, it's time to shop. And a credit card will buy a lot. 
Uh, this is a. <laughs> it says a number. number <laughs> in the twenties, this is outside my window. Two thousand nine. <laughs> that she doesn't sound that emo. No. Those were really hard years for me. Yeah, she doesn't. It doesn't sound like you the know, same person. I I always said back then I was like I was like I feel like I live five feet in front of my body. I was never in my body. I was always like just like let's go. Like I kind of had this. I mean, I feel a little vulnerable saying this, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um. I kind of felt like country music, I looked at like what Keith Urban was doing and like he was a huge expander for me because it was like really good music, like Golden Road, obsessed. Like I, it was just good music. And um, I guess I had this feeling like if my music was just good, that I would somehow get to a place where I then could kind of do what I want. I saw people just like, I had no idea like how hard it was to have a hit. I just had no idea. I guess I kind of didn't think it was going to be that challenging. I, it, and I was wrong. <laughs> and I think it goes back a bit too to like you just, I, I don't realize, I don't know if you realize you said it, but you're like, you know, make good music and then it all happens. But it's not just about making good music. No. It's also the promotion. Oh, it's also, it's a, the stars aligning. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I always had this feeling like, Wherever I would look like, oh, my God, they're aligning over there. Run, you know, to go over where they're aligning and like, OK, now go do that. Like rather than just being yourself and like seeing if they align. But that's a more sustainable way, I think, to have a career. Doesn't mean you'll be successful, but um, at least you'll be fulfilled. Yeah, I I've learned the same lesson. Yes, that I've tried it a lot of different ways mm -hmm. and that. If I continue to try in my most honest way, even if I fail, I realize that I was at least me when I failed, mm -hmm. which is way better than failing yes. when I wasn't exactly me. Oh, my because God. Because then I'm going, man, if I would have just been me, who, know who knows? It's the worst to fail when you're not being completely authentic. It's the worst. It sucks to fail if it's you, but you, always, you, but you realize, well, at least it's me. This is my you're honest proud. effort. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it really sucks whenever you weren't your oh. exact true self and it bombed and you're like, why did I do that? Right. Do you and feel that way with, with some oh, of these songs? Oh, it's awful. I hate hearing it. I hate it. <laughs> we just played it off. If you We're tag like, it. Torture. Like, if somebody tags me and they're like, oh my God, like Sarah Buxton outside my window and they put, I, like I would never post that on my stories. Like it's such a, it was such a hard time. Would you, if you were, let's say you're playing a show, mm -hmm. you, would you play outside my window? Hell no. Never. No, never again. Okay, well, let me play. <laughs> Th this is Stupid Boy. This is on your EP first mm -hmm. in 2007. She never even knew she had a choice. That's what happens when the only voice she hears. Now, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll talk about the, the massive success that song had with Keith Urban, but when you hear that back. That's you, me. Okay, I was going to ask because that That's doesn't me. sound the same as the other songs. Right. And it was treated differently on the record. We cut it with no click track, which is something you would never do if it was going to be a single. So you had a little more freedom to yeah. to, to go your own way, even in yeah. very small details, but you weren't right on right. with how exactly it's supposed to be. Right. Now, I'll say Innocence is, a, uh, is one that I feel like I was being more authentic to. Like, that's an actual story. And it's like... So, but yeah, I'm with you. Like, Stupid Boy was... Totally. There's just these songs that are gifts that just kind of land. And you don't really remember. I mean, I can tell you like the beginning of how that song was written, but. Well, I'm curious because you yeah. write it and then you put it on your record. Mm -hmm. And then did it until Keith, Nicole, and we'll get to that yeah. story in a second, until it was discovered and redone. Like, did it reach its peak? It was just a song that you were proud of that existed and then it kind of went away. Um. No, I, I felt that it was really special. Like when I, I, for me, like I, I felt like it was special for me. And then, and then he heard it. Like I, 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 it was just special to me. I knew, I knew the day that I wrote it. I was like, damn, 
I love this song. It was like a new, a new thing for me. How did he hear it? Well, Betsy uh, Cook is, was her name at the time. Now she has a different last name, and then her name became Betsy McHugh. But um, she was working for Borman, uh, Keith's manager at the time. And she's my age, really good friend of mine. And we were just meeting. She says that she played it for him on the bus. And then I've heard Dan say that he played it for Keith. So I'm not quite sure. We'd have to ask Keith how he heard it. But I heard that Betsy played it for him on the bus. And it wasn't like, do you want to cut this song? It was like, we, I really want you to meet this girl because, you know. Mm, it wasn't even about the song exactly. It was about the introduction of art. Yeah, and that was the song she picked to play. Mm. So it wasn't the ones they were thinking of as singles. It was like just the one that she thought Keith would like. Well, imagine if I had approached everything that way. But And the song probably that she thought best represented you as a person. Yes. Here is right. Keith's uh, Stupid Boy, by the way. Here you go. She never even knew she had a choice. And that's what happens when the only boy... CMA Song of the Year nomination. It won uh, Keith a Grammy vocal performance. And, you know, all of a sudden... You have written a massive hit. Right. And it wasn't all of a sudden. And that's what's funny is you wrote it, you recorded it, you're proud of it, you love it. Yeah. Then all of a sudden... Years later. You have a massive hit. Right. Now, does that change people's perception of you as a songwriter in mm-hmm. this town versus the yeah. artist only? Oh, I was so lucky that that happened for the longevity of, like, my life and just the way that I'm happy where I'm at right now. And, like, I'm... that. I would never be right exactly where I was if that hadn't happened. So if I'm getting this right, you stayed and the stars aligned over you. Oh, Bobby, that's amazing. Look how he just did that. I'm just, all I'm doing is observing. I just got chills. And th- that was the stars doing what they're supposed to do exactly. if you stay in the place that you're supposed to be living. Right. I want to play a few more, and this this will not be exactly um, in you know, the order we're telling the story here, but mm-hmm. some songs that Sarah's written. Uh, another Keith Urban song, Put You in a Song. Here you go. I want to put you in a song. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, the Band Perry. This peaked at number two, according to this mm-hmm. chart, in 2013. Here's Don't Let Me Be Lonely. By the way, both of those songs peaked at number two. Yeah. Oh, that, that, and there was a nut. So all so of them. Weird. So put you in a song, mm-hmm. stupid boy, and that was all number twos. Stupid boy was number two. Number two. I was talking to Keith um, because Keith and I are friendly. We're we're more than just acquaintances, but we don't hang. He's gone all the time. Right. But we're friendly enough where we can actually have a good conversation uh, about stuff. No microphones. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. And. So when we do have a microphone, he opens up a little more, I feel, because he mm. trusts that I'm not going to take him somewhere he doesn't want to go. I and love that. We were talking about, maybe it was, take your kids and take your freedom. Oh, yeah, you'll uh, think of me. You'll think of me. Maybe that one. But he, no, it was uh, Fly. Whatever. One of his biggest songs are often the ones that weren't number ones. Yeah. Like his career biggest songs. The right. Thi- the songs that he is known for. Yeah. And Stupid Boy's one of them. Yeah. Right. Weren't number one songs. Right. So I know. That number one is a chart. A, 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 it was, it's a business plan right. by a record label. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that these number two songs aren't oh, heavier in people's hearts. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, three I know. Three number twos. That is not funny. Ironic a bit. Well, everybody was like, oh, my God. Like, are, is it ever going to happen? When I finally got a number one, they were like, oh, my God. Was it the FGL song? Was that your first one? Sundays? To be honest, I, can't, I don't know if it was that one or Fix. I don't know which well, one was first. I can tell you because I have the years oh, on them. Oh, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was FGL. Here okay. you go. <laughs> and then two years later, because that doesn't mean you wrote them two years apart because you could have written them on the same day. I don't know. About I mean, the same time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's Chris Lane Fix. I got your fix. You know, one of my favorite songs, and she's just one of my favorite people, and I took her and she opened for me. And one of the great things that I get to do is take an artist that I love because I just want to watch them. And Jillian Jacqueline is that for me, and I just I just love her. Yeah. Who she is, her yeah. voice, her style, like everything about her. And so 
I'm a big Jillian Jacqueline fan. And I remember when she put out Reasons, I was like, this is such yeah, a good reasons. song. And you wrote Thank that. I'm going to play that here. Here you go. Got all our So that that is a very small nutshell, but uh, of your body of work as a songwriter over the past few years that people would know from the radio. Right. You got a lot of other stuff. Um, but I was just kind of pulling some notes from your life. I, I love Dan Huff. You mentioned love him. You him. mentioned him already. I love, I love him. him so much. Love him as a person. Also, it's he's a monster in, in the industry in many respects. I mean, he, yeah. as a player in a band, mm-hmm. as a producer. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you... in Dan get to know each other? Well, Craig Wiseman was, I had a list of songwriters when I first started kind of writing country songs, like before I became an artist and he was on there and yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, I have a quite a story of the first day I ever wrote with Craig Wiseman. It's freaking funny, but, um, I think all stories with Craig Wiseman are pretty freaking funny, but yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, I, I mean, he was a bit of a jerk to me and and I but I but I'm looking at this like I don't know I didn't know who he was and I and I just I was just going in to write with this guy somebody's you know my publisher set me up with older man older man Mm -hmm. country Mm -hmm. so I bring in a a topic I'm like I want to write a song about a girl that wants to just hang out and like doesn't want to get engaged like doesn't want a serious relationship and he's like okay that's cool and so I kind of started singing what I thought would be like a country song, you know, and he ends up playing the guitar. And so we're writing this bluegrassy song and he basically just kept leaving. And that's what he does. He's notorious. He'll like leave for an hour and then like come back. And he's just gone all day. And he comes back. He's like smoking his cigar. He's like, what you got? And I was like, well, uh, I'm thinking this. And he's like, that's your chorus. And I was like, my chorus? I was like, I don't know. I was like, let's just scrap this. This song sucks. And he's just like, you want to start a new song three hours into my afternoon? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, I would rather start a new song than finish this turd. And he's just like, um, I was like, this song absolutely sucks. I would never sing this. I don't know who would. And he's just like, well, I mean, I don't know what we're doing. We've got this bluegrass groove and it's like not what I typically do. I was like, but you're the one holding the guitar. So just like change the groove. Like what would you do? Maybe it'll just be better you're than this. You're having this conversation with him? Yeah. So you guys are just doing this. Yeah. I was just like, I don't know who you are. You're being rude. <laughs> and then he just started playing a different groove. And we basically, I'm just looking at the lyric that we had already written and I'm taking pieces of it and riffing. And we wrote this song in like maybe like 25 minutes, like super quick. It fell out, and then he's like, boy, I remember when I first moved to town. And he kind of, like, all of a sudden shifted, and he took me under his wing. And the next time I wrote with him, he was, like, talking about Dan Huff and about he just wanted to produce me. He, like, wanted me to go meet Dan. So he made a meeting with him, and we walked into some studio somewhere and just went and talked with Dan, and he had, Dan had heard my songs. And so that was it. Dan just became my... They were they were co-producers of my first songs, which was I was so lucky to be able to work with him. Like I, I've recently sent him a message that just said, you know what? I did know that I was lucky back then to be working with you, but I really didn't have perspective on like just how lucky I was. You're he's a king. He's absolutely a king. He's just king energy. You're he's almost so not supposed to have perspective though. Right. It's like the Craig situation. Craig Wiseman, just as big of a songwriter as it gets, and now it does way more than that record. The whole thing. Right. But imagine if you would have had perspective going into that room. I would have I been so scared. I don't think you would have challenged him. I wouldn't have challenged him. I'd had no stories of him. You're right. I had no... I think there is a time and a place for perspective, and we gain it, and mm, it shifts who we I are. I love but that. There's a lot of time we shouldn't have perspective. Yeah. Because that's our that's our growth. Totally. And I've, I am somebody that I've, I have to learn things by experience. I have to learn things like the hard way, kind of. It's just the way that I've always done it. And I don't expect that to necessarily change. I don't take anyone's advice. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm it, like, okay. The question that I was going to ask you, it kind of leads into where we are now. I mean, I was 
thinking about it before you came over and because you're wildly creative. Do you ever go in and let's say just for the sake of this, the name of the song is Walking Down the Street. Okay, mm-hmm. you go in, you say, hey, I want to do the song Walking Down the Street. You guys write the song, you talk about how one day you walk down the street and you ran into an old friend and that old friend, re- da da, song over. You're, and that song really doesn't, it, nothing really happens with it. Right. You know, maybe it's not that great. Maybe it's cut by the wrong person if it gets cut at all. And you're like, well, I like that idea. But what we did there with it wasn't right. So oh, will you yeah. go into a room and go, I have this song about walking down the street. Another the, room. Yes, another room with mm-hmm. other people. Your same idea, mm-hmm. but collaboration with people that you work in different ways with. Yeah. And then you present it to them, an idea that you thought may have worked over here almost still the same idea to other people, and then it actually turned into something. Yeah. Has that ever happened with you? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. It's a thing about taking a title back and taking a concept back. I think the way you have to do it is just trust that you've put enough kindness in the bank with people to be like, okay, that song that we wrote that is doing nothing, that hasn't gotten cut and is just sitting there, I'm going to take that title and you tell them. Oh, you have to tell them. I think you need to tell them. Because I would have called it uh, bebopping down the street. My second version would yeah. have been. I'd have changed it slightly. That's another way to do it. Yet. I've yeah. definitely done that. So, but there are times where you've not been satisfied with the result of an idea. Mm-hmm. For who It could have been your fault too. That totally. Day, as much as anyone else's. And you go, yeah, man, we just didn't hit it. I, like, I want to use this idea though again. Yeah. And you go to a different room with different people. And, and it you, works. But you will say, hey, room A, mm-hmm. that I'm wasn't good. It. I got to take it back. Are they usually receptive to that? I mean, most people are. I, I I mean, most people I work with are. I'm sure there's people that aren't. But I feel like I'd have one good idea. I take it to like 30 rooms. Yeah, same, the, same exact idea, yeah. and I just take it over and over to all I the know. rooms. I I took an I, I I actually texted, and I'm kind of learning not to do this. I think the lesson is don't do this. But like, I texted a friend and was like, "I have a song I want to write with you. It's called this, and well, it's they about wrote, they this." They write it without you. They write it without you. No, 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 no. Oh, but then, I was about to get pissed. but then, uh, but then, I, you know, I don't have anything scheduled with them, and then. I'm actually tomorrow wanting to go in and I oh, you gotta write, write it. it. Oh, and yeah. so I had to text my friend and go, I don't want you to think I'm cheating on you, but I am taking that title back. That stinks too. And he actually goes, Oh, that's funny <laughs> because like I just gave a title to so and so, and I think I'm gonna take it back. And I was like, Here's your chance. Text what I her. like about what you said <laughs> earlier is that if you have enough kindness in the bank, mm-hmm. yeah, the people will give you grace quicker, yeah, and probably fuller than if you don't. I am learning that that is, if you're generally pretty kind to people, like treat people well, let them know how much you love them. Like when you see them, really let them know that you can, there's just more, you can trust how much people love you. You can really trust it. And Yeah, I'm not a big truster, but I hear what you're saying. (laughs) That's also why I'm going to therapy in like half an hour. (laughs) You can trust it. I am getting better. Yeah, you can. You really can. I encourage you to. But that doesn't mean, like, you can just go be. Don't worry. I won't. Awful. I, I, but I'm generally not going to be awful to somebody. Generally, but occasionally. I'm kidding. I've been don't awful. An, don't answer. Yes, I've been we awful. all have. We all have. We all yeah. have. Yes. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> whenever you decide to finally put out your own project mm-hmm. and you're writing these songs, do you, is it? purposeful that you go i want to do a project for me or do you go i want to go out and write a lot of songs and you start to go wow this actually just kind of i is me i yeah identifying that so usually and it's been that ever since i broke the seal and decided to start releasing stuff i think it was 2019 i put a song out it was like the first one i'd had in forever um but it was called only the truth but like since then i've been putting things out but it was always things only the truth i did write for me And then I wrote Signs of Life. That EP was written for me. Moonriser was about, I mean, songs, you know, your life comes into your song. So it was about my life and I ended up putting it out, not knowing when we recorded them that it would be for me. But now I'm making another record and I'm actually really um, inspired to write for it. And it's a different kind of, it's going to be a little more indie, like pop kind of music. I think this is your problem. We're here talking about another record and you're already promoting something else. And I know, then it's you're like, awful. That's I don't know I'm how to songwriter. promote stuff. I don't. Okay, so. I just the, make stuff. That, it's, it's a problem. That we will talk about then. 
Let's the truth play. comes out. You see. Let's play. Perfect example. Uh, this Young from Moonriser. <laughs> I'm never gonna be this young. I'm never gonna be this green again. Time's gonna do what time does. It's gonna change everything again. I'll be looking back laughing at all the beautiful patterns coming of age. Letting each day go. This is the next track, Hard Things. Here you go. So don't tell me that I'm fragile. Not strong enough to leave Baby, I'm not afraid of hard things This CP is like my vibe completely because I like slow and I like sad and I like uh, not a lot of electric instruments. Yeah. Like that's, if I have a choice, Mm -hmm. I was just, and I haven't listened to it in a while, but I was... uh, I'm having like shoulder rehab. I hurt my shoulder like a year ago. And so the lady was working on my shoulder and I pick up, we have a jukebox over in the house and I always pick a, a full album to listen to. And I listened to the Nirvana Unplugged album because it's one of my mm. favorite albums ever, you know, I mean ever. And so, but from beginning to end mm. and like, that's my vibe. This is God, my vibe. I love that. That's such a good reference. I haven't listened to that in so long. I listened to that thing so many Dang, times. I even I know the that. word for word, the spoken parts. It's right. Like, this is a song by the Meat Pup. It's just like I can, I can like go along with it. Totally. And it's a live record. Um, on the Roof, this is uh, track four. Under a blanket of stars up here Singing out to the moon Wishing you were here with me On the roof A little too happy for me, but whatever. <laughs> Can't, hey, they all, they all can't fit you, right? A little too happy. And then here's uh, Runaway Love, number five. Love the project. I'm going to, only for 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you about the next project you're working on because I don't want to make it about that. And I know as a creative, it's always like, what are you doing now instead of mm-hmm. what? But what, what, what's the difference in the project you're doing, you're currently creating? Well, I, we were talking earlier about wanting to stretch your boundaries and do something that you've never done. And um, I asked Todd Lombardo to produce. He's an incredible acoustic guitar player. And we, we came up with the process originally because I was trying to, like, save money and do something kind of on the cheap. And so I was like, if, if it was going to be just you and I collaborating, and I was just going to send him songs that have fallen off of other projects, I was like, who's one person that you would call to um, work with? And he said, Nat Smith, who is a cello player that basically comes up with cello parts that sound like keyboard parts. He, like, finger picks it. And he bows, too. But he, he plays, like, in the bluegrass world with, like, Sarah Jaros and all kinds of different people. And in the studio that day, I was surprised, like, he didn't want to do these other songs. Like, anything that sounded too country, he was like, and I told him, I was like, I want this to be full-on collaboration. I want you to be a huge part of this. And so the songs that he picked were really interesting. It's a whole other thing. Uh, But, like, the process and watching the two of them work and the way that room felt made me want to write specifically, like, for that. And it's a different type. Like, one of the songs I I wrote with another artist, and I was imagining it kind of being like a Jackson Brown-sounding song with, like, pretty normal chords, and the, the melodies sounds like a Jackson Brown melody to me. And I sent it to Todd with no instrumentation behind it, and he put these chords underneath it, took it in a completely different direction than I ever would have imagined. And I was like, well, that's mm-hmm. pretty amazing. And so, yeah, I want it to be about the record. I don't necessarily want it to be like, it all starts with a song necessarily for this project. I kind of wanted it to be like, just a little more cerebral. <laughs> and that you know, sense? we when it comes out, we will talk about that. Yeah, exactly. And now we're done talking about now that. We're, so there we, you have we're it. we're done. <laughs> um, I want people to get to know you as an artist, and I hope mm-hmm. they check out Moonriser because it is fantastic. Thank you. Um, I do want to play for you now 
one of my favorite songs that you wrote. I believe it was uh, number four on the Hot Country chart in 2018. It's a little song by Mason Ramsey oh. called Famous. If I'm gonna be famous for something, I wanna be famous for loving you. That's such a good song. Like, if you take Yodel Boy, Mason Ramsey, out yeah. of it. That was such a good song. Yeah. Like, I think a lot of people could have made that mm-hmm. a smash. Yeah. Yeah. It did. It wouldn't matter who. I think you could put Tom's Red. I agree. And so what I remember thinking when he cut the song was, okay, this is good for him because it's like famous for loving you as a kid. It may, it's in the, but I was like, man, this song could have been a massive, I mean, a monster yeah. for an established artist. I know. And they would have kicked the door down to get it. I like, know. Was there any I, of that I was that hoping in you? for FGL. Like, that's what I really wanted because Tyler's on it. It and fits. I know. I really thought it was going to be an FGL song. And um, I didn't know you then. Right. I knew of you and we had met in passing right. a couple times. And I didn't know that you had <laughs> written this song at first, but I just remember hearing that song and going, oh, good for Mason Ramsey. Yeah. You know, I see what they're trying to do here. Right. He had, that is such a great song they have gifted him. Yeah. And just thinking, right. if anybody else had this song, it would be a monster. Monster, I know. Well, I just remember being like, at, originally going, he's so young. I mean, I don't even know how young he was. How old was he? Maybe tw- 12. Probably like 12. Yeah, probably like 12. 12, talking mm-hmm. about, I want to be famous for loving you. I guess boys would get to more of that of a feeling than girls. I don't know. I, when I was 12, I wasn't thinking about, I guess I was. There was boys when I was 12. But but I think as a boy, too, you are you think you know what it means. You don't. Know, you have crushes. No way. You just think, yeah, right. You just, but I loved it, and I thought that was just a Thank wonderful you. song. Um, and then Lady A, you wrote Ocean. Mm, yeah. What was the name of that album? Was I think it was it? named Ocean. It was, okay, that's yeah. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. If you get the title, and that's I guess that's why it came to my mind. If you get the title track, do you real? Do you think it's going to be a single? I I wasn't. I don't know. I, like, I is just, there a role? I hoped that it would. Yeah. And the song actually, this was a big realization for me. I I was surprised they didn't pick it as a single because it was streaming so well. It was streaming better than their actual radio single. Did you? And maybe I know so much about this. Did you write that? And I don't have this as my, in my notes. I could be completely wrong. Mm-hmm. Did you write that with Topher? Yeah, I wrote that with Topher, who wrote who I met on the Julian Project. Okay, that yeah, that's how I yeah. know the song, right? Because I know Topher. Yeah. Okay. He's the best. Yeah. yeah. And Abe Stoklasa. Got it. And th- this is a great song. And I think he too was, I was talking to him at the time and he was like, why is it not a single? Well, we learned it was because it was streaming so well. Like the label was making their money. You without, know what I mean? Without making it They're a like, single. We don't have to make it. So we can make another song a single yes. and still make the money off this. Yes, Bobby. Hey, so the label makes theirs, but you don't get to make yours. No. Uh, well, listen. I... But I was so proud of the way they, they recorded that. If you listen to the way, um, Gordon Moat is playing piano on that. And, like, they le- they took the click out. I don't know if they ever had it in, but, like, the way that they slow down on that last chorus just a little bit. I mean, I, when I heard that, I was literally just like, oh, my God, did they really just do that? I'm Dan, yes! It was like, so I was so proud. I thought, it's just to have somebody cut your song and then have you just be blown away by it is such a great feeling. She sang the Mhm. She often does, but especially in a song like that. God, she's yeah. so good. What do you So I did you write today? Voice. Did you already write today? I did write today was with it, Temecula Road. Oh yeah. Was it about mm-hmm. walking on the street because if it was I'm going to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but I got if that next. Tomorrow, yeah, yeah. I got that in my head. So do you come here tired, meaning n- emotionally or mentally Mm-mm. tired from the right? No, and I have learned I'm just at a different place with my writing. I feel like now that I've become just more prolific and the more like music that I'm releasing and the more I'm letting myself just kind of be open about it, I don't hold on to things anymore. I used to feel tired at the end of rights because I was blocked. I think my heart was blocked too, just in my life in general. And I just feel so much more open now. And the lyrics, it's just everything just is flowing so much easier for me. And the relationship that I have with those guys is just so good. And it's just a great day. I just, I feel energized. Well, I would be exhausted. Anytime I write anything, we write, we're writing comedy. I'm just like, oh, 
my God. I'm burnt. God, I'm just yeah. like, I've used every cell in my head to try to I be as funny as though. I possibly can. Yeah. And it's still not even that funny. Maybe I should be trying harder. Maybe that's what it is. I maybe sh- <laughs> maybe you only have massive success because you, you haven't tried hard enough. I've got to yeah. try harder. Um, One final note before we go, because we've done over an hour, which I hope you've enjoyed this. I have we real, I feel energized now. I'm not tired. She's going to write another song called Walking Down the Street. Watch yes. It. Um, we were, look, you were nominated for, this is not in my notes, but I was, Maybe like 2008. Oh, yeah. Maybe 2009. Maybe both years. Both. Yeah, ACM yeah. New Female Vocalist mm-hmm. of the Year. Uh, it was you, Taylor Swift, and Kelly Pickler. Yes. Totally. And and then the next year, it was me, possibly Kelly Pickler again, and Julianne Huff. So I know Taylor won at year one. Uh-huh. And Julianne won at the next. Yeah. Totally. That is, that. I mean, that's like a... Seems like a different life. It was a different life. It really was. Um, I remember getting Botox that year because they were like so young, and I was like looking at my face next to their face, and I was like, I gotta put some stuff Stop in my it. forehead. Okay, here's what's <laughs> happening. Here's what's happening. At Sarah Buxton, Sarah with an H, and you can follow her, and she just sometimes posts things like, "Hey, I will sing for you. I will come hook, cook for you." You just post things, like, messages, yeah. and like, I would like to. Sing more. I would like to yeah. cook more. I like to dance right. more. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's how she communicates. So who knows? Uh, but at Sarah Buxton, check out Moonriser. It has been a real treat to spend an hour with you. I love know it. You. It's been really cool. I've always been a fan. Usually from I wouldn't say 500 feet. From like 80 feet. Yeah. Totally. We're, we're like around one, each other. Yeah. We're like one person away all the time. Yes. Absolutely. If it's not you know Dustin or if it's not Topher or it's just you're right there. Right. If it's not Eric. Which now is, it's three feet. Now we are extremely close. <laughs> we're be- both better for it. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, and Bobby. And you guys check out Moonriser and check out Sarah Buxton's Instagram. She could use the followers. I really could. And so could I, frankly. Come on, Couldn't guys. we all? all right, Come thank- on, guys. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.